Jessica, I'd like to just start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to be here to speak to you all. I'm going to talk about the health impacts of methylmercury in fish and marine mammals. And when I say methylmercury, I want, to th I want you to think about methylmercury as a prototype for um, bioaccumulative contaminants. So methylmercury, like many um, persistent um, synthetic organic chemicals that we release, uh, biomagnifies in aquatic food webs. And what I mean by that is, I guess this shows. Um, so for each successive trophic level in a food web, so as each organism eats other organisms, you have a magnification of that chemical in a food web. So in aquatic environments, concentrations can be very low in the aqueous environment, so in the water or seawater, and you can get concentrations then in top predators that are a million times or more higher. And so what that means about your food source is then that that dietary intake becomes a concentrated source of chemical exposure. Now fish and marine mammals, so I work in a number of uh, northern Arctic populations, those are essential food sources for many of these people. So this becomes a, a, a large um, intake source for these toxic chemicals. Now methylmercury specifically has been associated with a variety of adverse health effects. The developing fetus is the most sensitive um, target for methylmercury, particularly during the third trimester of pregnancy. And this has been associated with uh, long-term neurocognitive delays in children. You know, I, I could go on about health impacts of methylmercury or, all, or any of these other chemicals. Um, I think we can all agree we would like less of them in our food. It becomes much more complicated when we start looking at the food itself. Um, so when you start to think about seafood or marine mammals in these populations, that's their traditional diet. If you advise people to change their traditional diet or to eat less fish, then you're introducing a whole nother risk scenario because moving away, so these, the, the fish and the marine mammals contain essential micronutrients like long-chained omega-3 fatty acids, which is what I'm showing you here on the y-axis. And as an example, you're seeing methylmercury on the x-axis. Okay, and these are a variety of commonly consumed fish species. So you don't want to advise people to consume less seafood because in our population, for example, we have a deficiency in long-chained omega-3 fatty acids in general. But so how do you craft advice then for consumers? And this has been the focus of the public health discussion around um, methylmercury and many of these bioaccumulative contaminants. You know, how do you craft a risk message that isn't actually harmful to public health? Um, you can see from this plot that you, it is actually possible to pick species that are um, relatively high in omega-3 fatty acids, for example, and low in methylmercury, or species that are high in methylmercury, but low in micronutrients. So you can craft a message, it's very complicated. So you think about introducing public health messages, it's very difficult to parse a message for the general public as complicated as this one. Um, my colleagues and I, so this was led by Emily Oaken in the, in the medical school, wrote a review paper on this in environmental health perspectives. If you're interested in this topic about sort of the, the various dimensions that go into to thinking about uh, individual choices related to seafood consumption. So bioaccumulative contaminants, um, the nutritional elements of seafood, um, the sustainability of those fish stocks themselves, and then the economic implications. So are these different choices affordable? And that's very interesting. It's been you know, it, it's, it's a complicated scenario because we're talking about, you know, intervening in people's, um, you, you know, what kind of dietary interventions could we make? Those arguments are largely centered on the North American population um, or the, the, the developed or developing or developed countries' populations. And what I'd like to introduce now is just getting us thinking more broadly about what perhaps are some other implications for public health of bioaccumulative contaminants in marine fisheries. So when you look at, so I always, I, I always start with, okay, well, so we want to ground this because fish and marine mammals are one of our last wild food sources. They come from the environment. Where do they actually come from? When we're thinking about changes in those contaminant burdens, you have to be thinking about changes in the quality of those physical ecosystems themselves. So 
you know, and the statistical data behind this is something that I've been looking at for a number of years. Um, so for methylmercury as an example, in the United States we get, so this is fisheries biomass that's being shown to you on, on the, in terms of the percentages on this slide. If we think about the fraction of methylmercury um, intake in the U.S. population, more than half of that is coming from the Pacific Ocean, specifically the Western, the Western Pacific Ocean because of the seafood species that concentrate methylmercury and, and where they're harvested. So, you know, we think about uh, global contaminants or bioaccumulative global contaminant, ca contaminants as distributed through the atmosphere. Um, sometimes we think about them as distributed through global ocean circulation, and we also redistribute them through the global commercial fisheries market, okay? So this is why we perhaps have been concerned from a public health perspective about releases in these different regions. Another dimension to this public health problem is the communities that rely on these resources exclusively. So we have choices. We have lots of food alternatives that can affect our health. When you think about some of these coastal communities, uh, um, in East Asia that rely on these resources, they have very few choices, okay? So it's an essential source of micronutrients, it's an essential source of protein. In the Arctic, if you tell somebody to switch away from their country foods, then they're immediately shifting to store-bought uh, food, which is just starch and sugar, okay? So it's a, it's a very large public health problem. If we look at, so this is, you know, transitioning into what my group um, has focused on over the past several years, again, for mercury. So we're looking at where do those contaminants go when they're released into the physical environment? Um, and what we find, so this is building on, recently we did a global inventory for mercury in rivers, and we put that into an ocean general circulation model to look at where does that glow, go globally, and how does it disperse? Um, and what you see uh, on the far side here is the Arctic, and this is zooming in on a region of, uh, on the Asian coastline. And what you see, obviously, is that there's a concentration of mercury in these um, coastal areas. And so the implication, again, when you look at the, the concentrations in these fish, they're already starting to exceed toxicological thresholds where we see effects. So this has been virtually unconsidered or not considered in the, the management of these fish stocks themselves. But the larger public health, I just want to leave you with this, the larger public health concern that I think we should be thinking about is what happens if you know, these large concentrations from industrialization in Asia, um, largely in the Arctic, a lot of these processes are being forced by climate variability, so permafrost melt, uh, freshwater discharge patterns, um, you're threaten you're going to start to threaten the stocks themselves. And so this is what we're looking into now. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you.